So welcome back to another session of canning technology and value addition of seafood. In the previous sessions, we were discussing about canning procedure for various seafood products. And we had discussed about step-by-step -step process. And we had also seen it, how it differs from product to product. And we had seen the pre-processing methods. And we discussed why this pre-processing is important and uh, what are the different tools that can be used at each step. And we were discussing about the food additives. In the last class, we stopped with preservatives and we'll continue with the preservatives. So preservatives, they are again classified into natural preservatives and artificial preservatives. Natural preservatives, they are also called biological preservatives. And generally, consumers, they prefer natural preservatives because they are derived from living organisms. They can be uh, plant or microbes derived. And these are generally secondary metabolites that are produced by plants or microbes as a defense mechanism. So whenever there's an infestation or there's some threat to the plant or to the organisms, they produce a secondary metabolite for, to protect themselves. And these secondary metabolites, they are considered or they are used as preservatives. They increase the shelf life of the uh, product and they can be categorized as antioxidants, flavorings, antibacterials. We have different types of preservatives in the food, lysozyme in egg, uh, then saponins, flavonoids, bactericides from lactic acids. We also have antimicrobials, which are basically polyphenols, and chitin and chitosan. And this can be fungal derived or commercial purpose, we derive it from the shrimps. And these also have antimicrobial properties. We can also have conjugates, or derivatives of uh, chitosans that also exhibit a natural preservation process. And major group of preservatives, they belong to the phenolic group. And these are very strong antimicrobial agents. And basically, they have phenolic functional groups. And to this group, uh, eugenol, thymol, carbocol, these are some of the examples of uh, plant phenols. And basically, they in interrupt with the uh, cytoplasmic membrane and this is the way how it brings down the microbial population or kills the microbes. The chemical structure, it exhibits antimicrobial or antioxidant property. And if you look at the figure here, the preservatives, they exhibit following properties. Because of their structure or the size of the molecule, they are permeable. They, so they increase the permeability of the membrane. They may enter into the cytoplasm and lead to coagulation so that cell integrity will be lost. And it will also act on ATPase, so ATPase molecules may be arrested or they may not be available. Then it alters the cell membrane and also disturbs the cell membrane permeability and integrity of the cell membrane. Eventually the microbes are lost or they are killed. And then it also exhibits anti-quorum sensing. Uh, quorum sensing is the property of microbes where they identify the population and it, it is a genetic mechanism by which they they respond to the, the other microbes. So this is also interfered uh, when preservatives are added. But a major disadvantage of bioactive components of plants are that though they have antimicrobial property, they have to be added in higher concentration. So it is not only the plant derived preservatives, most of the natural preservatives, they have to be added in very high concentration and this may interfere with the properties of the food. So it may uh, cause uh, undesirable changes or it may also give a flavor change or order change. So that is the main disadvantage that is observed with uh, natural preservatives. And uh, propolis is a insect derived preservative. It is derived, it is bee glue actually. It is uh, derived or it is a combination of saliva and bee wax. And it also contains uh, other ingredients which are collected by the bee from the flowers. And uh, it's the part of nectar. So uh, it contains polyphenols, quinones, cumarins, steroids, amino acids and other inorganic compounds. And it has a very high uh, antimicrobial activity. So it's basically a resinous uh, product. It's natural. Chitosan is another uh, natural food additive or it's a preservative. And it's basically the deacetylated form of chitin. Chitin is commercially, it is prepared from shrimp shell or crab shell. And these are deacetylated uh, to form chitosan. And this can be changed. The structure can be changed by different modifications. 
like silation or alkalization which will enhance the property of these food additives. Now we also have artificial food preservatives. These are also called chemical preservatives and such kind of preservatives they are synthesized and these are not from the natural sources and examples are caffeine which is used as a flavoring agent also. Then we have saccharin and the very commonly used preservatives are sorbic acid and its salts. It is used in pickles or uh, juices where you have to prevent the growth of fungus. So it's an antifungal preservative and uh, it is used in foods which have very high pH and benzoic acid and salts benzoates are also used and these are used as inhibitors of other microbes. It includes bacteria. These are also used in acidic foods including pickles. Then we have salicylic acid, parabens and we also have sodium benzoates and these are also used in juices and uh, these inhibit the bacterial growth and fungal growth. Together we can use both benzoic acid and sorbic acid. They can be used collectively or in conjugation with each other. The properties will be enhanced and generally this sodium benzoate it is converted to a nitrogenous molecule and it is excreted through the urine as a hippurate. And we also have sulfur dioxide. It is another food preservative. And sulfur dioxide is used in beverage industries particularly. It is used to extend the shelf life of wine. It is also used in the case of dried fruits and potatoes. And uh, these are some of the structures of uh, preservatives. We have benzoic acid, vanillic acid and sorbic acid here. And then another important group is antioxidants and along the antioxidants we have carotenoids, vitamins and polyphenols. You can get it from natural sources like red wine, tea, onion, spinach, eggs and plant oils. These are all rich in or they are natural sources of antioxidants. Antioxidants they, they interfere with free radicals basically. So free radicals which have an odd unpaired electrons in the outer electron, they are highly active and they can be related easily to oxidative damage. So we have a reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species and we also have superoxide radicals. They are generated as a part of energy generation, as a part of electron transport chain and these reactive species they cause oxidative damage. And uh, it can be prevented by enzymatic method and non-enzymatic method. In a physiological condition, enzymes like catalase, glutathione peroxidase, they will help in reducing the activity of these free radicals. Also by non-enzymatic methods, by using vitamin C, vitamin E or tocopherols or carotene, uh, or there are other uh, additives also or antioxidants, these will inhibit the action of free radicals. And apart from these uh, natural sources, we can also add synthetic antioxidants like BHA, BHT, we also have ubiquinon. So these are synthetic ones. So there are many ways to minimize the action of free radicals and prevent oxidative damage. This can be done with the help of enzymes or it can be done without the help of enzymes. In such cases, we have to go with the additives and also a mixture of additives. So these antioxidants, their property can be enhanced when they are mixed together. So they exhibit synergistic activity and uh, it's a better result actually. When it prevents the antioxidants, when it prevents the oxidative damage, it prevents change in flavor, change in color, change in texture. It also uh, protects the other macro components and micro components. But these uh, changes, the oxidative damage in the food, it can be related to cancer or it can be related to other health issues, even cardiovascular diseases, it can be correlated. So uh, when we prevent oxidative damage in food, we can have a control over such kind of diseases. Also in, in our body, when we are stressed, uh, free radicals are produced in large amounts. And uh, this in, in a physiology, uh, the enzymes can play a very important role in preventing or reducing the amount of free radicals. So free radicals, they are a very big area and it need lots of attention. Uh, the oxidation, it starts with uh, initiation. We have product which releases the free radical and this free radical, it couples with oxygen and propagates the reaction and this continues uh, un until it is terminated by another free radical. So here antioxidants comes and binds and it is terminated. So 
whatever free radicals has been produced if it is allowed to bind with the antioxidant immediately we can stop the reaction so that is why antioxidants are very important and antioxidants they low the activation energy they donate hydrogen that is they are proton donators they hold back lipid oxidation and they also block the generation of free radicals and further they are of different types natural and artificial antioxidants now these are the different artificial uh, antioxidants we were talking about we have propyl gallate we have pha bhq so the typical structure of antioxidants they help in preventing oxidation so basically what we have seen preservatives antioxidant and nutritional additives they are the most important ones but we have other additives and uh, we can see here in this uh, slide we have gums we have thickeners stabilizers sesquiterns sesquiterns are chelators they chelate the uh, metals for example there are uh, reactions where metals they uh, speed up the reaction they act as catalysts so such metals they can be trapped and made unavailable chelators and sesquiterns they do the same job edta is generally used as a chelating agent then we have propellants. Propellants are inert gases which are used in whipping cream and other things. And then we have glazing agents, gelling agents, starch and other polysaccharides. Then we have flow treatment agents. These are used for dough making. For bake in bakery industry, we have flavor enhancers which enhances the flavor. MSG is a flavor enhancers. Then color retention, coloring agents, emulsifiers firming agents. So these are in individual types of uh, additives that can be generally seen in the food industry. Not all food additives are good and also there's a level for using food additives. We cannot use a random level and there are uh, dangers associated with many of these food additives. They may cause uh, hyperactivity or attention deficit disorder in children or people when, who are sensitive to this kind of uh, additives when they consume it they may also develop uh, allergies like rashes vomiting hives then uh, tight chest headache so such kind of uh, dangers are there even there are some serious uh, disorders also like uh, gastrointestinal disorder when we, the saccharin is consumed it co also affects heart cause uh, cancer and it is also tumorogenic in nature and caffeine in small amounts it is good for health but in, when it is taken in large amounts, large doses, it will cause nervousness, heart palpitation, heart defects, butylates, they raise cholesterol level, impairs the liver and kidney. Then we have bromates, which causes nausea and diarrhea, benzoates, it causes uh, rashes and asthma, even it uh, damages the brain. So uh, within limits, it can be used, but if it exceeds the limit, then it may be threatening it is important that we label it properly. So here, if you see in this particular product, Doritos, they have used a red color. The color has been used. So it is mentioned in the label, blue one, yellow five. So the colors, whatever colors has been used, whatever ingredients has been used as an additive, it need to be labeled so that people, and also here they have mentioned that it contains milk as an ingredient. So people who are allergic to milk, they can avoid the food products. So labeling is very important and from the additive perspective also. And coming to the canning industry, the common additives that are generally used are salt. Salt is a class 1 preservative. It is used in processing and brining and it should be highly pure. It should not contain any uh, magnesium chloride or other contaminants because it will react. Uh, the magnesium, this is an, a contaminant and it will react with ammonium and phosphate in the tissue to form struvite. And struvite is like the small glasses. So when you open the can or the container, you may find on the surface some broken glass pieces might be seen. Actually, these are not harmful, but these are formed in the container due to the reaction between magnesium, ammonium and phosphate. But it interferes with the acceptance of the food product. Then we have vegetable oil, and which is also used in the canning process. So it is used as a covering liquid. So it is used to cover the food product. And we have definite standards in Codex for olive oil, virgin oil. We also have standards for other vegetable oils. So you have to refer the standards to get the specifications and other things. And we cannot use vegetable oils, which is from GMO crops. 
and also the, there are specific limits for free fatty acids and peroxide value. These are directly related to the rancidity, so it should be within limits. Then tomato paste, which is another covering liquid that are being generally used in case of mackerels, uh, dine and pilchards. And these we use in tomato paste. This should contain around 28 to 30 percent soluble solids. That is the general range. But there are tomato paste which has uh, TSS of 30 to 32 percent and 36 to 38 percent. So that is also okay. We can utilize it. But in uh, general, we go for 28 to 30 percent. So the standards of tomato paste is also given in the codex. And it mentions the viscosity, pH and count that should be there in the tomato paste. There are other ingredients like spices uh, which may contain allergens. The details for this are given in Directive 2003-89 EC. Now, uh, this is a codex alimentarius. So, when you go to the alimentarius codex website or uh, you download the general standards for food additives, you will get a, a PDF file like this and it will be written as like this codex alimentarius and in, at the bottom you will find general standards for food additives codex stan 192 1995 so it was adopted in 1995 and since then lot of modifications has been done and uh, there you can see the revisions that has been done uh, and the year wise revisions it is given and the different food categories are there nine is specifically meant for fish and fishery products so uh, if you look at here it is 9 is again divided into four different categories and 9.4 it deals with only the canned preserved fermented fish and fishery products and it includes mollusk crustaceans and echinoderms so echinoderms are sea urchins or sea cucumber and you will also find the details of other types of products that can be developed from fish and other sources uh, whereas the fish based snacks they are put under different category they are put in 15 that is ready to eat savouries now broad category it, it is divided into fresh fish and processed products that is 9.1 it stands for uh, fresh fish and 9.2 to 9.4 it is for the processed products it includes all the aquatic vertebrates that is fish and aquatic mammals including whale it also includes mollusks, then aquatic invertebrates like jellyfish, crustaceans, and echinoderms. And even the fish products that are coated, that is uh, glazed or spice strip, they are also included in this, but they will be notated as glazed or coated or surface treated products. In the category 9.1, we have subcategories also 9.1.1 and 9.1.2. This specifically deals with fresh water fish products and under the processed fish products we have ready to eat cooked smoked dried fermented salted products and again we have subcategories in this so you can go through this literature and 9.4 it deals only with the fermented fish products canned fish products which includes uh, mollusks crustaceans and echinoderms and these products they have extended shelf life they might be developed by steam retorting or pasteurization and they are packed in airtight containers, vacuum sealed and they ensure sterility. So such containers or such products, they are categorized in this series and the details or the standards related to these products, they are given under this head. So if you look at the table here, this is an extra C. So whenever we are going to add an additive, we have in a canned product, in a canned seafood, we have to refer to these uh, tables. Uh, it is an extra C, table 1, table 2, table 3. So these, all these four tables need to be referred. And also there is a table on general instructions on flavorants. So all this need to be referred before we add additives. And uh, if you look at the an extra C, we have 3-1, 1981. That is in 1981, it was uh, accepted and it, this uh, standard is for canned salmon and it is put under the head 94 similarly we have canned shrimps and prawns again the standard number is 37 and it is again under the same head so under this head we have uh, canned shrimps or prawns canned tuna and bonito canned crab meat canned sardine and sardine like products and canned fish 
Many products have not been listed under this. We have standards for a few products and a lot of new products are being coming up. And this is an example, canned tuna, where we use uh, acidity regulators, emulsifiers, gelling agents, stabilizers and thickeners. We can also use flavorings and these flavorings, they have to follow the guidelines given under CXG 66-2008. And uh, so we have to refer all the tables that is table 1, table 2 and table 3 before we add additives to the product. This is the table 1. This is how it can be seen. So acesulfame is, is a sweetener. It is an artificial sweetener. So it is, it is for the category 4 that is uh, 9.4 uh, to the canned and fermented fish products. And here you can see the amount, the maximum level that is 200 ppm. So it should not exceed uh, 200 ppm and this was adopted in 2018 and under this heads you can find the notes which are relevant to acesulfame. Similarly we have for acetic acid so table 1 it gives the informations about the product and their standards and to which category it belongs and there are food products which are considered as GMP. So the, this acetic acid in certain food products it is considered as GMP that is we have to follow good manufacturing process. So limits are not there for such products. Then similar ones are amaranth which is also added and it is, the levels are given here. Amaranth is a colorant and aspartame is a sweetening agent and we ha also have aspartame acesulfame it is also a sweetener. Then brilliant blue is a colorant it is a synthetic uh, colorant artificially developed and uh, 500 ppm is the maximum level and butylated hydroxy enisole, butylated hydroxytolvine these are antioxidants and the levels are also given it is same for uh, both then we have canthaxanthin, caramel, caramel 4 these are all colorants carmine is a insect derived colorant it is derived from the insect and it is basically carminic acid then we have carotenes derived from vegetables carotenoids edta is a chelating agent it chelates the metals the neotame is a sweetener phosphates these are used for holding water they help in increasing the water holding capacity conchu red is again a derived colorant then riboflavins these are nutritional additives saccharins they are sweeteners then uh, stevia glycoside these are natural sweeteners derived from stevia so you can see the levels also here Sucralose is another, then sulfites, we have sunset yellow and tartrazin. So these are the additives that are added to canned and can fermented food products. It's not necessary that everything has to be added. We can selectively choose what is required and then add, but it should be within the limits. And table 2, it compiles everything. So here you can see this is for the category 2, 1, 3, which contains lard, tallow, fish oil and other animal fats. It is particularly for the fats. And you have uh, antioxidants, carotenoids, that is colorants and emulsifiers. The INS number is also given. This is the E number, uh, 304, 305. It stands for E numbering system, the, which we had discussed in the previous class. That is 304. Uh, will be specifically for ascorbyl esters. So we have uh, E numbering numbers here, then we have uh, the year and the maximum levels that has to be maintained. And this is similarly for 9.4, which uh, for canned and fermented food products. Uh, so you can see here we have acesulfame, it belongs to 950 E number, similarly the year and the uh, maximum level. Then this is table 3, and in table 3, there are certain additives which has not been included in table 1 and table 2. Such additives are included in table 3 and their functional properties are also given in the table 3. So if you are going to add acetic acid, glacialistic acid, from this table you will know that it has an INS number of 260 and what it does it do? What is the functional property of the acetic acid? So it can be used as a preservative and acidity regulator. So wherever we have to regulate the acidity, bring down the pH we can go for acetic acid and the year it was adopted and then we have different informations on the commodity. So likewise we can get other informations from the table 3. So we have come to the end of this session and in this session we have discussed about different additives, food additives and uh, what are the most important additives in the food industry 
and what are the other different uh, various types of food additives that also we have seen briefly and then we discussed about the additives that are being used in seafood industry particularly for canning and how codex standards are laid and how we can choose the additives by referring to the codex standards that also were discussed in the class so thank you